Yeah, what yeah. is it about a, um, a non-Shakespeare script that says, this is a Utah Shakespeare Festival script? Um, what, what do you guys look for in something like that? Uh, heightened language. Not always necessarily, but, but language driven, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which Mary Stewart Sheila certainly is. Um, uh, I think universally human, you know, universal truths, universally human themes that are both theatrical in scale, but also um, grounded and um, behavioral in scale. Uh, and for us, I think in this outdoor theater, what makes Mary Stewart so perfect is that uh, it's another sort of intimately epic tale. You know, that's what Elizabethan tale. Yeah, Elizabethan. Too, you know, it's about I mean, that's me. that's why Cyrano worked out here. It's a giant three-person play, really. You know what I mean? It's why um, uh, Faustus, Doctor Faustus, worked out here. It's a two-person, very large. I mean, it's not just two characters, but centrally, there's all these external forces working upon two or three individuals, and that's that's helpful for us out here because it keeps things, it keeps scale of story in perspective for this space, but it also allows us a giant kind of breadth to the human language. And also, Mary Stewart's a really important play for us, for the, our patrons, because it examines two of the, the sort of giants of history in a what-if situation. Yeah. You know, that's a pretty cool kind of thing, you know. It's also, you know, it's also sort of celebrating some of these plays and putting them on a stage that is Elizabethan, it's Tudor, it's not, it's not distracting from the play, it's enhancing the spoken word out here, you know. It's different from doing that play in the Randall, where we would have a lot of scenic elements probably around the particular play that might create some sort of thematic, you know, statement. It's quite different out here. It's all about the drama, the word, and the interaction, you know, and Mary Stewart is really potent that way. It's all about that. Plus, I imagine if we had put before a designer what we're going to do, Mary Stewart and the Randall, they'd say, "Why don't you just do it outside? I won't have to build any scenery." Right. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's, yeah. it's totally. like we'd end up with a design in there that would be probably reflective of what we already, already have exactly. out here. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's just cheaper to do it in the outdoor theater. Anyway. Right. Well, <laughs> we don't quite like we to wish. put it in there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Artistically, it's yes. they'll put the money in the costumes. So that'll be yeah. Well, we have to do that. Yeah, we it's will. a huge costume show. <laughs> now, uh, beyond next season, um, the Shakespeare Festival is fundraising for a new building. Um, tell us a little about, a little bit about what kind of facility it will be and your goals for, for the building. Well, the immediate goal for the building is to address our needs. There's no, there's no reason to build the building uh, if we don't have the need, and we do have the need. And I think many of our patrons. Uh, we haven't done a great job of delivering the message of the need, and that's why we're rebranding, revamping up our efforts right now to get out of that. We're in a wonderful situation with Southern Utah University in terms of incredible collaboration between and partnership between the two institutions. But just as ambitious as we are at the festival about the things that we want to do moving forward, we happen to have a really amazing and awesome leadership team right now at the university who's also ambitious. So they have plans for the university. And so for us, what that does is we want to support their needs, they want to support our needs, and we don't have enough space <laughs> to do that, to grow together. We are in desperate need of rehearsal rooms. We cannot expand, we cannot expand a, a minute beyond what we're doing right now because we have no space to rehearse. We're rehearsing plays in, like, the old Radio Shack building in the fall. Yeah, uh, in the, you know, uh, yeah once, this, um, once the school year begins. Because right now we share space with the university. Um, and that becomes challenging in our... So yeah, we need kind of an artistic hub, frankly, and and the need for the new theater itself, uh, in conjunction with that, other facilities, will provide us the opportunity to grow. These shows that live on this stage deserve to be seen in the format of a matinee, and be provided opportunities for people to see them. If we have a retractable roof and we figure out a way to contain and and control climate. Um, we essentially, without doing a thing, double our potential for our programming just by offering um, Midsummer Night's Dream in the afternoon in the same space that it was designed for. You know, uh, that's a big that's a big component. And I think uh, I'll let Brian talk about um, sort of our our plans in conjunction with that building in terms of some programming we'd like to look at. 
Yeah, I mean, another issue with it, as David said, the need is sort of paramount. And I think a lot of people don't really understand that. Like, we, there are a lot of issues that we face underneath this building. In our, underneath us right here. Yeah, in our dressing room space and our the number of bathrooms that we have down there. Anybody who's worked for us knows the challenges that we face backstage in this particular venue. And, uh, and it's something we have to address because the plays aren't getting any smaller. You know, they're basically huge plays with 18 people plus, you know, a lot of them. And there's a lot of bodies down there. And right now there's not a whole lot of space down there. And so we're trying to address that as well as having a space that is acoustically similar, the same, it's the same building, essentially, with a roof that will give us more behind the scenes, more rehearsal space, more dressing room space, more office space, more storage space, all the things that we're really, really lacking and struggling in right now. Um, Great. Um, I was like dying for some time. Yeah. <laughs> hey. This is 50 year celebration of Wanda right here. <laughs> Happy birthday. We got we got the the um, the fairies brought Shakespeare fairies brought some water. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. appreciate that. You know another thing with the theater just speaking about that that part of our goal and is you know we also want to extend our programming past the time that we're performing at right now. I mean right now we usually stop our shows in August, early September because the university begins. And anybody who knows if they live in southern Utah or anywhere in the state of Utah, October and September is a beautiful time to sit outside and watch a play. And that's another reason for the move across the street. So we're not in competition with the university schedule that we're working alongside it. Um, and then also hopefully extending into some of the winter months possibly too with ex having the closed roof, maybe beginning of early, early spring, that kind of thing, uh, which is definitely on our mandate. Um, so, you know, I, I think you've made it really clear how this would change the festival. Maybe more plays, longer, more performances, um, and that would be the part that the audience would see, and behind the scenes, more rehearsal space, more space for your needs. Um, how else, though, do you believe that this would change the festival or the university if you're to finish fundraising for the new building? Well, I think it would, uh, I personally think it would hopefully make it more of a destination spot in the country. Not only to come see plays, but also an academic hub. You know, that's one of our things we're working with with Southern Utah University, of really utilizing the fact that we have a university that's right in our backyard as a learning uh, institution that we can begin to use maybe some company members as part of the academic programming for the university. And we can use some of those students that it becomes a training ground for them to step into our company, work in the summer, and then go back into the classroom. Um, part of the, I mean, we're an artistic, you know, organization, and part of what's exciting about expanding in terms of a new building also is, you know, Brian and I are really interested in like thinking about a project three years out. You know, we're we're committed right now. We've said it out loud that. We're, 2013, we're going to look at producing the history cycle in a row, you know, for our audiences, uh, one after the other, you know, and looking at some interesting ways to do that. Well, when you start thinking about a new building and you start thinking about projects or developing projects, you know, all of a sudden we've, we're thinking about it without being locked into a kind of finite calendar right now, which dictates so much of our programming. We can think about what would it be to artistically collaborate with a group of designers and writers and whatever to put together. Uh, and workshop over a couple of years some children's literature to be realized into a fully realized production late in the fall here because we have the space available. Mm -hmm. um, so all of a sudden it opens up this avenue for us to talk to our patrons and say, hey, how would you feel if two shows opened in April and then four more opened in June and then three more opened, you know? What does that do for you? What does it do for your vacation? If it ruins it, then we can stay where we're at, you know? But we have 10,000 people here for the summer games in May with kids all over the place that deserve a chance to see, while they're here, one show. And I know the university would package it with us to say, they're coming for summer games, they get a ticket to the Shakespeare Festival, 
that seems criminal that we're not, you know, able to provide access for students and for for others uh, while while they're here. So it's it's things like that that really right now we can't explore because of uh, the workings of, of our, our, our calendar and the workings of having these spaces shared. Interesting. Yeah. Um, last question um, before we stop recording. Um, this festival's celebrating its 50th season, so here's the logical question. What about the next 50 years? We've already talked about you know fundraising and you know next season specifically, but beyond that, where where do you see this festival heading in half a century? Well, we've kind of talked about it a little bit. I mean, it, to be quite honest, I mean, it's expanding our programming further months in the year. Uh, producing all of Shakespeare's plays in the next 10 years, uh, having our audiences view the entire canon of his work, developing our new play, our new play program to see some of those productions fully realized, expanding our educational uh, outreach to the festival, building a new, younger demographic to our audience base, which is a huge, huge component for us. That's why you guys are here. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Reaching out, you know, and doing productions that might resonate on more of a younger generation level. Um, all of that is sort of, you know, on the horizon. But it's also sort of doing what we do best already, and we have been doing really well, which yeah. is creating great work, celebrating the work of William Shakespeare in a venue that's synonymous how those plays should have been done, you know, and, and not disregarding that. And, and you know, yeah, we keep saying we don't want to paint the theater green or pink. You know, <laughs> yeah, there's not a lot broken. You know, it's just about how do you expand? How do you expand on the success of what's already there? But you know, I keep thinking about marketing tool. You know, marketing tools as well. Like, wh what do we look like? What do we sound like? And and how does that engage people? Not just in terms of what we do with the plays. I mean, how do we engage with the community? You know. If we get this theater, when we get this theater built, you know, we're looking at the Adams and, a, and another building and a theater all on one side of the street, and we start to have a, a hub, there's going to be a different experience for the patron that I think is better. Our service is going to be better. The festival is going to feel really centralized. There's going to be a lot of activity. There's already a lot of activity. Yeah, you won't have to cross that street, you know. Those kinds of things are part and parcel with how we sort of start looking and closing our eyes and saying, wouldn't it be great next year or in 2013? to sit down and in every single program, I'm hoping that it would be great if we could get an app. But if we can't, that in every program, there are the 36, 37, 38 plays of Shakespeare, depending on what you, what, how we define his plays as we go down. And it will say, you know, 2013 to 2023. And you'll get a pen to check them off because of our commitment to wanting to do this. Actually, we should probably start with Titus, because I doubt we're going to produce that again in the next 11 years. <laughs> right. But I mean, engaging an audience in a way where their ownership, which they already have here, uh, is reinvigorated in a new kind of way. You know, if we could get it on phones and everyone could, you know, by year go, oh, we, we checked these three off this year. We, next year we're going to check an entirely different three off, you know. Um, it's also, I mean, I mean, we're a destination theater. People come here from all over the place, and they spend three days here, and they immerse themselves in the work of William Shakespeare, as well as his you know, contemporaries and everything. And I think our goal is to continue that, you know, that it, it's not only celebrating his work in Cedar City, but it's also like celebrating the state of Utah, the region, you know, that it really becomes a must-see destination. You know, and part of that is just producing world class theater.